Welcome to QD Clinic. I'm Jack Cush with Room Now. QD Clinic is brought to you by Room Now Live 2022. Let's talk science, technology, education, and patients. Step. These are our versions of TED Talks. We've got several of them during the meeting. They're really cool. Short talks given by great speakers. One's called The Music of Rheumatology. The other one's called The Death of Caravaggio. And another one's called uh, How Stopping Drugs to Protect the Fetus Leads to Greater Harm. All great speakers. Those are our step talks, TED Talks, that's going to happen throughout Room Now Live. Go to roomnow.live to register. Today, we're going to talk about the CSF and lupus cerebritis, lupus psychosis. It's now better called neuropsychiatric lupus by all the experts. The case is a case of a um, a 25-year-old woman who just got out of the hospital, was diagnosed two years ago with lupus, had a prolonged hospitalization for um, a number of medical problems. Um, interestingly, though, no lung, no heart, no um, renal involvement. She had some mentation problems, and since that hospitalization has not been the same, meaning when she's gone back to school, um, she's in college. It's been noted that she's having problems keeping up, remembering, rem remembering, and and whatnot. So now she's going for, you know, cognitive testing. And the question is, is it, could that be neuropsychiatric lupus? She's now stable, right? She has no evidence, serologic or clinical evidence of active lupus. She's on medicines, including immunosuppressives and modest doses of steroids right now. Um, she's on hydroxychloroquine. Question is, could she have cerebritis? So do you have to have really um, uh, big evidence of active lupus to confirm or suspect lupus cerebritis? No, you don't. That can happen irrespective of other markers of lupus activity, although in general, it tends to be a little bit more common. But we, any of us who've seen a lot of lupus certainly have seen patients with psychosis and um, and many of the manifestations of lupus cerebritis um, in the face of what looks like otherwise well-controlled um, disease on usual medicine. The real problem here is the diagnosis. How do you make the diagnosis? First off, you have to suspect it. It is estimated that about 50 to 55% of patients with lupus, systemic lupus, will have neuropsychiatric manifestations and presentations throughout their disease course. So that's important. We worry about seizures and psychosis. And interestingly, those are really quite rare um, in the grand scheme of things and that in ways that lupus presents. We had a tweet on that just a, last week. I think it was in the, you know, like point something percent. That was really quite low um, when you look at a large cohort of lupus patients over a long period of time. Same can be said for seizures. Um, it's often, the, you know, the case of cognitive dysfunction or sometimes more focal disease and whatnot. The diagnosis is made by what? Number one, considering it. Number two, um, uh, doing imaging. What do you do? Is there a, a test that you should do for imaging? Is there one that's better? Um, it turns out imaging is largely done to exclude other diagnoses. I've often said the following, that if a lupus patient is admitted to the hospital, they're usually going to be admitted to the hospital for a medical problem, not for a lupus problem. So meaning lupus patient with chest pain, MI, lupus patient with chest pain and shortness of breath, you know, PE, which may or may not be related to lupus, or pneumonia, which is probably not related to lupus. Now, could it be related to the medicines they're on? Sure. So the immunosuppressives and steroids bring into play other medical problems. But it's not going to be a lupus problem. That's different, however, in the case of a neuropsychiatric admission for the lupus patient. There, it's always going to be more likely neuropsychiatric disease from lupus than it is going to be from comorbidities like CNS infection, you know, the effects of uremia, the metabolic effects that are going on in that patient based on their disease or their drugs or whatever. Um, so again, you need to exclude these other causes. One of the main things that you're going to do is imaging. The second thing you're going to do, and again, there's not one that's any better than other. You can't truly diagnose vasculitis on an MRI. You can see bright signal, what they call UBOs, unidentified bright objects, usually around the ventricles and whatnot. But that's usually due to some edema or gliosis, 
and is not truly representative of vasculitis. We don't know. And again, there is no vasculitis in, uh, in a lupus cerebritis brain. There's no vasculitis. It's a bland vasculopathy, right? So you can't diagnose vasculitis as the MR guys often like to do. If you think it's vasculitis, do an angiogram or an MRA and you won't find vasculitis. So, but you will see bright objects and you will see some signal um, that's sort of meaningless. You might find evidence of stroke, small, large, whatever in the past. Um, but you're looking for other causes, you know, things that lead to, um, you know, shifts and pressure and, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Um, you're not going to do any better with a better scan other than a CAT or an MR. So PETs and specs are, are not indicated here and not proven to be valid, valuable. EEGs are useful in finding, um, you know, uh, seizure activity that may, have, uh, may go undiagnosed and they should be considered in people with altered mental status and or suspected seizures. CSF testing is where it gets dicey. So the percentage of patients who have a um, pleocytosis in the CSF is substantially small, right? So 20, 30, 40%. And you're expecting to see a lymphocytic pleocytosis. Um, a neutrophilic pleocytosis is indicative of either drug effect or infection and not cerebritis. A lymphocytic pleocytosis, and it doesn't need to be a lot. It could be four cells, six cells, 12 cells. It's not going to be hundreds of cells. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you look at protein and glucose. You can get very low glucose levels, but there you should think of TB and infection. You can get abnormal protein levels, but that's horribly nonspecific. And for that reason, you need to do CSF testing, asking for both albumin and IgG levels on the CSF and simultaneously on the serum. And with that, you can calculate one, the Q albumin a poor man's measure for blood brain barrier intactness. And two, the IgG index, the IgG synthetic rate, the IgG loc, these are measures of, is there more IgG being produced within the CSF than in the blood, suggesting more in situ immune activity within the brain space. For first, let's talk about Q albumin and BBB. There are recent studies talking about the blood-brain barrier in lupus being intact. In general, it is with only about a third to 40% of patients will have a slightly elevated BBB abnormality. And the normal number there is your serum, what is it, your, your CSF albumin times a thousand divided by your serum albumin. And the number is usually less than nine, which means that you have a normal intact blood-brain barrier. One third to 40% of lupus patients will have a slightly elevated nine to 15. And that's not a major problem, but it's still abnormal. That's in keeping with lupus. When it's 20, 30, 40, 50, you now have disruption of blood brain barrier, vascular events and infection are the two primary causes for a, a Q albumin of 100 or 90 or 60, right? Now, if the Q albumin is normal, then you can just look at the IgG index. And if it's elevated, that means there's in situ production that indicates immune activity in the brain. And that couldn't be supportive and found in 50 to 60% of patients with cerebritis. But if the blood-brain barrier is abnormal, the IgG index is no longer applicable. That simple calculation, which is the serum, uh, the, the CSF IgG over albumin divided by the serum, IgG over albumin, all with the units normalized, hard to do a calculation. Um, you can find a website that can do it for you. Uh, and, and again, if it's elevated, it's not valid if the blood brain barrier is elevated. There you have to do the either the synthetic rate or actually better something called IgG loc. Some people like to do IgM indices as opposed to IgG. I think they're equally well, but I think IgG is eas more easily done in most people. Are there other tests you should do? Antineuronal antibodies, I don't do them. I don't find them useful. Um, looking for immune complexes in the brain, I've read about them. I don't find them to be useful in most people and not, not worth getting. Um, they're often done. So it's looking for oligoclonal bands. It's often done the workup of MS. Um, uh, uh, the anti-ribosomal P antibodies in the CS, in the serums would make you suspect CSF or CNS disease like psychosis, 
You could also do it on the, C on the CSF, look for antiribosomal P antibodies. That sometimes is useful and maybe worth doing. I think if you're considering CNS disease and lupus, you should be doing a panel uh, that you would do for antiphospholipid sy syndrome, okay? And a complete panel. Is there any value in getting autoantibodies in the CSF? No, there is not. That's never panned out, not worth it. And that's my workup of lupus cerebritis. You know, treatment of it <laughs> after you've made the diagnosis is supportive treatment, high dose steroids, and then changing up their immunosuppressives, maybe getting more aggressive. There is no one thing that works for most patients. Time may be your best tool. That's it. Tune in for more QD clinics. Go to roomnow.live to register. Take care.